Hello and welcome to Edukimi's YouTube channel. My name is Bharsh Singh and in this video we shall discuss current affairs and gazette for today, 31st January 2022. Welcome to all the participants, people viewing offline. Welcome, good evening to all of you. Uh, we have Netra Bhabani, lost soul, peace lover. Welcome to all of you, good evening. Hi Jugnu, hi Ashish, hello Hima, good evening to you. And uh, other people joining late. Welcome. Hi, Kriti. Hi, Ravi. Good evening. Good evening to all the other people joining a little late. No worries. No problem. Uh, watch at your own time. Akhila, good evening to you and other people as well. All right. So it's it's a great uh, initiative that we have started together that we have a uh, community conversations, people having doubt with each other. You have a question with optional. Please go ahead and ask each other. No problem. It's great that we participate live because uh, this is the way we can also interact with each other. Right. So there is a regularity, there is motivation, there is something that uh, is a little beyond than what we do in offline. While in offline, if you want to view, not a problem, but view at a faster pace so that if you, at least you're not interacting with us, then at least, uh, you know, it saves time, right? So, uh, all right, so let's begin this conversation. Um, what do we have in the current affairs segment today? Today we have three beautiful articles, three updates. They are uh, one, the federated digital IDs, federated IDs that we are talking of. What are they about? We'll understand this. And the second one is on uh, standalone energy storage systems. We will understand how, what are the ways in which energy can be stored and how this policy is going to help us. We have initiated a draft policy on the same. And third one is on some of the communities uh, on which you people are, you know, discussing right now. Some communities which are refugees in our country and uh, what's happening around them all right we'll understand this in totality this day in history dedicated to national commission for women is it a constitutional commission statutory or uh, non-statutory body can you please tell me in the comment section statutory uh, constitutional or uh, non-statutory feature news for today is on ukraine russia crisis a lot of discussion around ukraine uh, and russia we have understood in in many of the uh, Editorials, what is happening, but today we will understand in totality what is the issue between both the countries, what is the stakeholdership of European Union, USA, how is India going to participate here in the feature news, interesting article from international relations. Image of the day on a lake from Coimbatore, rejuvenated and a site for, uh, for uh, the ecological indicators, butterflies. Terms for today, beating retreat, artificial snow, neo neocope and Jeevan Rakshan Padak. Three editorials that we have for today are uh, one on core inflation, the second one is merit meritocracy in public sector employment and the third one on judicial infrastructure. Case study on a person from IIT dedicated his life for uh, social development. Let's begin this conversation. All right. What's the conversation? Statutory. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. It is a statutory body, Ravi. Non-constitutional, but statutory. But statutory. It is not uh, produced by government policy, but it is a statutory body. There has been an act which enabled this. All right. So, let's go ahead with this conversation. This is on uh, the first snapshot, Federated Digital Identities. Right? So, what are they? See, do we not go through a process where we are looking forward to our identity cards? Now, just few, few, it's been few months I was looking for my passport. It has got stamped visas of certain countries, but I'm not even able to look for my passport. Similarly, uh, if, if we have to uh, submit uh, income tax, we have to have a PAN card. If we have to prove our nationality or, uh, you know, citizenship, and there are times when we have to vote, then there is a voter card. So when we go abroad, there is a passport. And then we also have many other documents, right? We also have an Aadhaar card so that uh, government universalizes its service delivery through Aadhaar, recognition through Aadhaar. Four I cards, I can write away point out. And what about the driving license, right? Something that uh, uh, helps us to be on the roads and drive our vehicles. Five of them straight away right here, but there are innumerable other I cards also released. What about the farmers taking loans from the government given an I card? Yes. What about uh, uh, the case of health insurance? Health insurance, there is a provision for uh, digital eye cards here as well. What about uh, students, college going students, school going students, eye cards, working professional eye cards 
and uh, so many and uh, other ways in which i cards are mandatory and required but this multiplicity of i cards must be must be simplified this is the way this is the way through which uh, one of the digital governance initiatives can become successful right so uh, government miti uh, ministry of information technology and electronics it has initiated an end ea 2.0 that means india enterprise architecture 2.0 in which it talks of digitizing these ids and uh, synchronizing these ids so that we do not need multiplicity of ids so that verification of individuals receiving schemes from the government can be further simplified so whenever you look at an article like this what should come to your mind immediately is digital india digital india initiative right and if you are a user of uh, uh, certain apps there is a dg locker dg locker it's a it's a very good app in which all these identity cards the government identity cards they can be presented online itself this is a repository it cannot be stolen it can be it is also authenticated uh, even despite we don't have the physical i, I cards so this is the architecture under which not only dg locker but all the other i cards will be synced right synchronized we will come to know if if we need so many i cards or not so there will be rationalization of uh, i cards rationalizing of id cards there will be better privacy features if you have operated dg locker it is very very authentic and uh, it ensures good privacy so there will be control with citizens and it will have privacy by its design right so these are some features of it it will help us uh, verify the individual and through this service delivery will be easier very simple so this is the main purpose of it now digital india three keywords should come back to all of you right all the digital diligent people it must come back just just the way make in india has three segments digital india has three segments what are they so creation of digital infrastructure huh? the second one is uh, uh, so this is connectivity right the second one is uh, uh, provision of digital services delivery services so e governance in initiative service delivery but all this can happen only when people are educated so digital literacy see you have to remember this for once and for all right once once done it will be done for all the times to come so these are the three uh, you know three parameters under which digital india these are the three pillars of digital india initiative and then furthermore if you get into it there will be various schemes of the government we have covered digital india in a feature news previously so uh, for digital literacy there are many abhyans you know government is running in rural country uh, and and urban areas as well for service delivery we have various functionalities for example this um, uh, availability of uh, uh, dg locker itself is digital service uh, availability infrastructure building infrastructure is in the form of bharat net project or optical fiber network all of them right so this is the reason that this has been in news right so very very important scheme now example of this example of this if we have a digital i card right why do i enforce on examples see one very simple and good example of this is that while people take pds public distribution scheme uh, you know uh, uh, entities for example they have taken rice so how much rice they have taken it must be linked to their identity cards right right now there is there may be you know physical written thing it might not be in the digital format that is what is required if that is enabled then there will be no diversion of these kind of valuable products right right now people don't even know that it is written in their name that 10 kilo of uh, rice has been taken on their i card but it has not reached them it has been diverted so valuable government resources getting diverted during corrupt uh, uh, under corruption if this is validated with aadhar card this will this will enable better target identification and service delivery as well this is one of the purposes another example of this is for example if we have uh, invested in a mutual fund it must be linked with pan card yes this is already mandatory everywhere but this has only happened in a couple of years no before that we had so many bank accounts and we would operate uh, in uh, you know all these bank accounts in isolation in silos they were not integrated to our pan card now if we have this initiative all the bank accounts will be linked government will be able to track it governance is the system through which the whole uh, 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 management of the country it's interlinked right so whether through private initiatives or government initiatives so this is why uh, this end ea enterprise architecture 2.0 is a mandate and this is what we have explained in the first snapshot all right meeti has proposed to establish a federated digital identities right now nowadays state governments release their own i cards 
many of them, innumerable of them. So there will be complete rationalization through this uh, 2.0 structure. All right. This is what we have explained. Those examples that I mentioned, very, very good, important. They are not mentioned here. So this is the first snapshot. The second one is on standalone energy storage systems. Now, when we have promised that we will create so much of uh, electricity, which is non-conventional, which is renewable in capacity, 40% of uh, now, all the energy that has to be produced in the year 2030, that will be through renewable sources. What is the total energy that we are looking for? This kind, this should be around 400 gigawatt. Am I correct? Or is it more? Or 500 gigawatt? 500 gigawatt. All right. So this is what we are targeting uh, by the year uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2070. Yes, 2070. Right. This is the thing. 2070. So when we are targeting this, who is going to purchase this energy, right? And plus, how are we going to store this energy before anything? Because this is renewable energy, it has got its own side effect. Sun is not present during night times, wind is not present all the time, right? So are sea waves. So, so is the geothermal bed, which is not hot all the time. How do we utilize this energy? How do we store this? This is where the government has come out with the energy storage policy, which when I say government, it is not the, you know, the prime minister's office. No, a ministry under the government, ministry of uh, renewable uh, energy has come up with uh, um, a draft notification on, on uh, ESS energy storage systems. It says that one can, now see this is a draft. So one of the entities of this is uh, that people can store uh, standalone systems also. We can, people can have standalone energy storage systems. It is not that if there is an energy storage system, it has to be interlinked with the power grid, with a bigger grid. I hope you understand what is a grid. All of them need not be linked. Yeah, I can build a separate entity for myself. This is one. It in, ensures good utilization of energy. The second one is that it can, it will also ensure interstate transmission, interstate transmission. These are keywords for you to use. The first one also standalone and interstate transmission. This is one. And there will be also lesser taxation on uh, these kind of energy storage systems and transmission systems. Lesser taxation so that this is promoted. And this will also be under a part of the renewable purchase obligation. What is this RPO? Every entity, every distribution company and every uh, big player in the market, consumer of energy is obligated that they will have to purchase certain minimum renewable energy. Because when 40% we are creating through uh, renewable, this demand has to come. No, this demand now will be created, artificially created, later on it will become a habit. So these are some very, very important entities under this. But, but uh, the scientific question, now these are, you know, uh, pointers for an answer, but scientific question still remains there. How are we actually going to store this energy? This is not available to us, no, all the time. So uh, this is where I have shown some technologies and this is where uh, this is the differentiator between what you are doing with me and uh, between reading just the text. So there are many ways in which we are, we can try to store energy. One is battery storage, right? So through chemical processes, we store this energy. In the morning time, this will get charged. In the evening, we will utilize this. The second one is potential HEP, potential hydroelectric power. How do we do this? So what we do is that the same amount of water is utilized and it is, you know, it is put at a high pedestal, at a higher altitude through the renewable energy, through wind energy, through solar energy, it will put at the high platform and then it can be sustainably utilized to, you know, come down the hill track and then again generate the HEP, hydroelectric power. So this is potential hydroelectric power. Uh, the uh, Another one is compressed air. So what we can do is that while this renewable energy is available to us, we can compress the air and then later it can be used to generate energy through movement of turbine, right? And uh, 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 this is a flywheel. The fourth one is a flywheel. What is a flywheel? Now, this uses magnetism. This uses the principle of electricity generation as well. So, what happens is if we have a fan, if, if this is a fan, it can be made to move. It can be made to move through the help of uh, renewable energy and using principles of magnetism, it, it can actually keep moving on itself also because because of uh, principles of magnetism, right? So when this is able to move by itself, 
it will keep on generating some energy or the other not that it will keep on moving all the time it will stop later slowly and steadily but uh, but this can be later utilized and once the energy decreases then again more energy can be provided through renewable sources so flywheel these are some ways in which we can store energy for a longer period so thus thus we avoid the shortcomings of a uh, energy storage through conventional through non conventional me uh, conventional mechanisms so please note these four these are good examples for you to you this will be the differentiator between you and between people who are only reading text right so now uh, this is the second uh, snapshot right so nearly 450 gigawatt uh, will come from renewable sources by 2070 right so this is it and we are talking of energy storage systems so these are the energy storage systems that we spoke of the four of them right they will become a very very important part of value chain system for energy and if you remember uh, the solar grid that was in news that is a part of this the international solar alliance the international solar grid all that we are pro proposing it is already a part of this this whole system energy storage system and energy transmission system right so this is where we have explained all of them all the parts that i spoke of first creating on large scale one delicensing that means we don't need license to do this we can privately also handle this uh, act renewable purchase obligations rpo these are the keywords sale purchase of power right it will be subsidized as well through this storage space and transmission right and uh, some penalty curtailment of renewable energy will be penalized all right these are the two snapshots the third one is on chakmas and nahajong community right so first of all how do we know which are the communities which have come to india seek asylum or residence in our country what is that so let's quickly look at that community first all these community we have covered this in uh, a featured news previously right the uh, how india handles refugee community so let me quickly make you go through this now this is the refugee history in the independent india in 1947 people from pakistan region they came to india first time right first uh, refugee crisis and then handling of it then we had tibetan refugee crisis in 1959 and then 1964 and 1960s chakmas and hajongs from bangladesh came to india and then we had uh, bangladeshi refugee itself during the time of liberation of bangladesh east pakistan then afghanistan refugees in 1980s right the first time there was turmoil in afghanistan and right now again afghan refugees we also had rohingya crisis and sri lanka refugee crisis 1980s late 80s and 90s right the millions the millions of people seeking refuge now india does not maintain an official uh, policy for um, refugees there are advantages there are disadvantages see uh, there you, you people discussed on this right and i expect accept uh, I, I really admire and accept your points they are very 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 much valid at their places while i asked for suggestions you people said that it's very tough to give a suggestion on a thing like this how can it be improved see before getting into this article let me only quickly share how european uh, countries do this but they also have their strategic advantage why do they do this and how they do this this is a very good case now norwegian countries uh, countries uh, which are doing one of the best in hdi indicators in the world you're talking of uh, norway sweden uh, all the countries in that belt right so those countries they seek refugees they seek refugees from uh, countries in africa countries in asia and now it is such that second generation of those people are also living there united nations it provides funds it provides resources it provides food for all the people who want to uh, who have been accepted in another country it provides funds and resources to those countries which have accepted refugees there is a better uh, international rapport also as far as human rights is concerned so europe stands far ahead in those terms but why does europe only do this it is because it is primarily because europe is in a better position than other countries the population here is also slowly and steadily stabilizing receding there is less tendency to give birth so uh, this is the reason that europe has done it but what about a country like india see india maintains a policy of strat strategic the it's a very good keyword to use the policy is called as uh oh, let me show you what that word is we use the policy of strategic ambiguity strategic ambiguity we do not tell if we are going to accept those refugees or not but invariably sometimes we have to accept sometimes we are mandated see india is the bigger country in the subcontinent right 
bigger country in the subcontinent. Point being, if Sri Lanka has Tamils, Indians also have Tamils. If Tibet or Chinese population has Buddhist uh, population, we also have Buddhist population. If there are tribals along Myanmar, then tribals exist in India also along uh, the northeast area. If there are Sindhi community and Hindu community in Pakistan, Afghanistan, or people who are persecuted, persecuted Muslims as well, they, are, they do exist in India as well. So there are times when we have to accept them perforce, even when India cannot uh, withstand the economic burden or uh, there could be security implications or and before that handling its own human resources. No. So even despite this, India has to accept it. But India maintains strategic ambiguity right now. India can get funds, but then providing citizenship to these people, it's, it's a question. It's a question right now. Also, uh, another issue here is the politicization. Politicization. The whole nation has to politicization. The whole nation has to be in sync as far as uh, accepting an immigrant uh, policy is there, right? So uh, many kind of people they enter India, right? Some people uh, seek refuge in a country. Refugees. Refugee is different from migrant, right? I can migrate to USA to study. I can migrate. And it can be a mid-term migration. I can come back after working for a few years. I can be a long-term migrant. I can go for, for tourism. That person is also a migrant. But refugee is largely a person who has been persecuted, who was forced to run away from their homeland, home country, and seek refuge somewhere. Refuge. Huh? In, uh, we seek refuge during times of rain. Chhatri mena, right? Uh, or in a building. So refugee, right? And some of these refugees are also those refugees who seek asylum asylum right sharnarthi called in hindi right so uh, and they are they are uh, you know positives and negatives both of it right so negatives could be uh, for example uh, internal security ad hoc political and uh, economic strain in the country but on the other hand the benefits are also there humanitarian needs moral responsibility and the globalized world benefiting the host community. Once, once we start to accept refugee community, the, the emotional and spiritual maturity of the indigenous community also grows. In this context, let us come back to the article here, right? So what is happening in our country is that uh, we have faced innumerable refugees uh, coming to India, right? And Northeast is one of the places which has uh, incoming, seen incoming population of refugees. See, uh, we are talking of Arunachal Pradesh in specific right now. All right, Arunachal Pradesh in general in uh, Northeast as well. So if you look at uh, Schedule Six, Schedule Five and Schedule Six, under one of them, under one of them, four states have been covered. Right, four particular states of Northeast: Assam, Meghalaya, uh, Tripura, and Mizoram. Four states have been covered. Right, which is that schedule? Schedule Five or Six? I have explained this innumerable times. Right, so uh, this forms uh, tribal autonomous councils (TAC)s, and for uh, the other four states, there are three more states. But then one state got repeated here, Mizoram. So we have Arunachal, Nagaland, Imphal, and Mizoram. Please note down. I'm going to talk about something really interesting here and important here. These four states, where where Mizoram gets repeated, repeated, right? In uh, which schedule? Please mention which schedule. Which schedule? 5 or 6? Okay, quickly. So, this state has gotten repeated Mizoram and this is called as inner line permit, ILP. Right? So, when anybody is entering these places, they have to seek a permission from the district administration to have an inner line permit if they come there for tourism or a mid-term uh, uh, thing as well. For example, employment. They might and this is for only Indians. Right? And there are people and see there are people who are coming, there are relations across the border as well. No, so when we have a country like Myanmar, and then uh, there are communities, for example, Chin community, Chin community, persecuted community, and this is one of the strategic points between India and uh, Myanmar. When we discuss India Myanmar relations, Chin community is the one which is also revolting, and they also keep entering Mizoram and uh, Manipur, right? Because they are Chin relatives, they live in the Indian side as well. Earlier, India would be against these policies of Myanmar, but now, uh, you know, in favor of, uh, uh, you know, policies of Myanmar, 
where it would it would actually help in locating these people who are you know rebels chin rebels but now india has stopped this so we will understand india in india myanmar relations right now let us understand the refugees who have come in so it is not only chin community which seeks asylum here temporarily but there are many communities which came from bangladesh during various times during um, uh, china uh, the wars with china or uh, incursions from china right so example 1950s when uh, when uh, Tibetan region was annexed by China, a lot of Buddhist monks, they came to Himachal Pradesh, right? Mr. Lama himself came and uh, he established the government of exile, government in exile in, Tibet, in, in Himachal Pradesh. And along with him, in 50s and in 60s as well, a lot of uh, Buddhist monks also came. Many of them settled in Arunachal Pradesh, around Tawang, Tawang area. Then onwards, uh, 1960s, there were construction projects, right, in Bangladesh. We were constructing uh, dams here and people had to be moved. There were also re religious persecutions in Bangladesh before it got independent. And because of which people ran away from, uh, uh, from Bangladesh and they came to India. Who am I talking of? I'm talking of Chakmas and I'm talking of Hajongs. How do we know which community are they from? H for H. Hajongs for Hindus and Chakma are Buddhist. Both are minorities. Both got persecuted. They, they ran and came to India. We didn't have borders right then. No, we did have, you know, actual borders, but, you know, fencing wasn't there. It isn't there at many places even now, right? It, border patrolling is not something that is very much feasible in these kind of areas. They entered and uh, they settled in places like Tripura and many other places. They were made to settle at other parts because it was a refugee crisis. Later on, many, many people from Bangladesh, they migrated to India, West Bengal and then Asma and other places because of uh, um, the religious persecution and because of persecution during the times of uh, East Pakistan, West Pakistan war. 101 crore plus people entered during those times. So only a few thousand people entered this place, you know, Agartala, uh, Tripura and other states. And later on, they were made to settle in Arunachal Pradesh. To be specific, in uh, the Changlang district of Arunachal Pradesh, this area, right? I'm talking of Chakmas and Hajongs, right? But this was a small population, say around uh, 5,000, 10,000, around 20,000 people from East either of the communities but later they started to grow they would be children they would be children of children and uh, there would be two to three generations now politicization of this issue that these people are outsiders they do not have rights over india this has led to many revolts happening and this has not been through arunachal pradesh this started with the state of assam right assam 1960s then 1980s they were uh, uh, assam accord signed in 1985 and uh, before this the idea was for the for for, for the, the the main protest was that that the outsiders should go back to their places right so these outsiders were two kinds one international and international both of them international for example bengali bihari community or marwadi community or other tribes from various other places everybody should go out right they would be called as um, uh, dhakars dhakars right Bengali, Marwadi, Punjabi, Sindhis, all of them are outsiders, please go back. And the other one would be against the international uh, people who came to India, right? And meanwhile, they would be seeking empl employment benefits, central government would be trying to do something for them, but the state government would not be happy about this, right? Now, what has happened lately is that the state government of Arunachal Pradesh, it initiated a, a kind of, a, a, you know, census for those people, Chakmas and Hajongs. Now, through this, what are we trying to do? We are racially trying to segregate this community. And this is where the National Commission for Human Rights intervened. And this is why it was stopped. This activity was stopped. Because once they are figured out, then there will be more persecution of these people uh, in our country. Now, many of them, 90% plus now of these people who have been spotted, they are born in India. It is high time we should start accepting them. Yes, there have been challenges, but what to do? These people will be stateless. This was a part of the Hindu itself. And Chakmas, Hajongs, should we treat these people as stateless? Especially those who are born in India, right? So this is a very, very legitimate question. Question of ethics, question of uh, pragmatism in our country, question of security. For the sake of security, we must start accepting them, integrating them in the main, mainstream population. This is, this is how a visionary should actually think like, right? So, um, Earlier, what used to happen in these areas, this was the interesting part, that this inner line permit, 
was formed by the Britishers. You know why? They said that these are those reserved areas, protected areas, where we do not want outsider, any outsider to intervene because we do essential trade here. We trade in tea, we trade in uh, uh, you know other things, for example, elephants, right? So, uh, because of this, they said outsider people should not be coming back to uh, these particular places, right? And uh, they, also, also the oil, right? So, Assam, uh, uh, you know, oil, Digboy oil fields. So, because of this, they said nobody should be coming from outside, but tribals would keep on coming and they would, you know, uh, they would try to, you know, uh, stop the processes that Britishers would use to generate revenue. This is one thing and the Britishers also wanted that uh, there be less competition for commerce. That is why they initiated this inner line permit. Britishers should know that who is doing commerce and they should, you know, uh, seek permission from the government. Post-independence, the government said that we will ensure that inner line permit exists. But this is not in the name of government's autonomy. This is to preserve the tribal autonomy. This is what people in the northeast say that outsiders will not be allowed, especially in these states, outsiders will not be allowed because uh, tribal autonomy is uh, violated, right? Our rights are violated. So this is the whole context of this uh, issue here. Now, when you want to visit these states, no problem. Seek uh, approval from DM, right? 15 day ILP will be given to you. It can be extended further. If there are people who you know, right? There's some of you from Northeast who are watching this video right now. If, if they now, approve of you, you can stay there for six months. So, you're most welcome. So, this is the situation and uh, the communities from outside are getting persecuted. This is what we have covered here in Chakmas and uh, Hajongs. I hope you will remember this issue. How do you remember these communities? Hajongs, H for H Hindu, Chakmas are Buddhist. Both of them came from Bangladesh. The one community were to come here because uh, of uh, some construction of dams in uh, in Bangladesh, they had to run away, they didn't get land, the other one because of religious persecution, all right. And the Supreme Court has already said that we should start giving them uh, citizenship rights. But on the other hand, the state government is not, not ready and this is further politicized because of uh, uh, certain communities, right. So, this is the thing in uh, Northeast India. It was initiated, all this, uh, you know, uh, these kind of protests were initiated in Assam, but then they started to, uh, you know, uh, happen in the other states as well. All right. See, so we have given the example of uh, Chin as well, Chin community. There are largely uh, four communities here. The four communities that we are speaking of are uh, are Chakmas. Uh, they were there in the newspaper. All right. Never mind. There are four communities. Two more. All right. It's it's here. Yeah. Chakmas, Hajongs, Tibetans and Yobins. Yobins are uh, are uh, the people, the tribal people living along uh, uh, along Myanmar and uh, India both, right? And then Chin community as well. All right. So this is what we covered here. It's all here, right? And what should what you should do right now is revise this uh, segment of citizenship quickly from the constitution, from the Bear Act, if you do that, right? So if you do that, you will be able to re relate to it. Now, one thing that I want to share here is that India, at times when we say maintain strategic ambiguity, what is the reason for this? See, um, Afghanistan, right? So many people from Afghanistan have migrated to our country in the last uh, twenty years. Twenty years. When Taliban has been ruling, uh, uh, had not been ruling, even then they were conducting many attacks here and there. So many people from Afghanistan, they came to India and uh, in the pretext of ensuring that, uh, see, I'm not judging here, but I'm telling you the reality of situation here. So uh, one child would come here to study. This is how it would start. And India also wants to integrate the neighboring countries, right? So uh, one child would come here. For example, a son or a daughter, preferably uh, say a daughter only, any 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 of them. And then once they study here for a couple of years, slowly and steadily they will they'll get integrated in the population. They might as well get married in the country. And once they get married in the country in India, then the complete family of this uh, child has got rights to come and meet them. They will start getting visas for this. And through this. Uh, a huge chunk of population of, uh, of Afghanistan is already settled in uh, urban, peri-urban areas of Delhi, Bangalore, Pune, many other places, right? 
so this is how we are trying to integrate our neighbor's neighbor here as friend but does it give uh, you know more uh, burden of population yes it does does it strain our economy yes it does so but then this is the cost of uh, you know a neighborhood like pakistan all right all right six thank you very much each of you all right moving ahead so Ashish says, sir, apart from these issues in CAA 2019, doesn't it help to solve refugee problem like in the case against Chakmas and Hajong? Um, CAA is a little controversial to speak about on this. The India must have a standard refugee policy. This is what I want to say. A standard refugee policy which is not based on uh, religion, community, race, gender. Just refer to the constitution no? whenever there is a controversy that arises in your mind right? or outside. We must have a standard refugee policy, that is all, right? This day in history dedicated to National Commission for Women. Thank you for explaining that, yes, this is a statutory body. And uh, whenever there are, uh, you know, uh, issues around women and it has not been addressed properly, we keep discussing women issues, no? National Commission is one of the pioneer bodies which raises these uh, issues. Although statutory, although although under government, although it has, it is, you know, the people here working in this are appointed by the government, yet, uh, these people have a level of integrity and they, they ensure to raise the rights of women throughout. All right. So this year's uh, theme is She the Change Maker. All right. National Commission for Women. India. India's participation in Ukraine-Russia crisis. We will understand this along with understanding what has been the issue between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Minsk 1 and 2 agreements, participation of European Union, USA. What has been so much of fuss about? We will understand this and how India plays a role here. Right? Interesting feature news for today from international relations after this video. Moving to image of the day. This is the image of uh, uh, lake in Coimbatore. And this is an important lake because lately it has been found that this lake got rejuvenated because certain issues like, for example, dredging. Through dredging, we could take out the sediments right around this area. And through increased rainfall, it ensured that the whole area developed a Miyawaki forest. See, look at this kind of forest. What is it? Miyawaki. So, what is Miyawaki forest? So, these are Japanese type of forest growing technology to which we grow dense forest at a smaller area only. Dense forest at a very small area, possibly an urban area. And uh, these are quick, quick growing forest. They help not only people retreat but also provide valuable oxygen, help cleanse the air. So this is what has been growing in Coimbatore and this, this has also led to uh, the presence of 80 plus butterfly species. Butterfly. And why butterfly specifically we are talking about because this is a very very important indicator of ecology of the region. Butterfly, then we have snails, birds, presence of specific kind of fungus, fungi, all of them are very important indicators of uh, the ecology, right? Bioindicator. So that that word, bioindicator, is a valuable word for you, right? So this is how. What is the image of the news in news? All right. Now, for people from geography, you can also look at the place around Coimbatore, which we are talking of, Velalor Lake. All right. Moving ahead to terms and concepts. This is a mistake from my end. A sincere mistake. I. How did I forget this? We also had the beating of retreat parade on Saturday, just this Saturday, two days back. And it is such a beautiful parade. And this year we did something exceptionally marvelous this time, right? First was the light and sound show. And the second one was uh, the swarm drone, swarm drone show for the first time at the, uh, at the beating retreat parade. Now this is what you see as the swarm drones. This was created in the sky itself. These are drones, right, around... Uh, uh, a thousand drones were there, it, they lit up the Racina Hills area, I wish you had watched it live, I was in goosebumps, Feel, felt amazingly proud because this was all indigenously manufactured, all of them by IIT Delhi students, not students anymore, of course, startup uh, India and um, amazingly done through the swarm drones, you would have understood, we have, we have covered swarm drones quite a few times, so swarm drones are, we say, you know, sw swarm of mosquitoes, swarm of uh, um, Flies. Similarly, these are many drones and they have, they have their own mind but they are operating in sync 
in sync this video is available on youtube at least watch the last 15 to 20 minutes uh, on the youtube of this video where you see not only swarm drones but you also see um, the uh, a considerable part of indian history through a light and sound show now why do i say this is it going to ensure that you waste time not at all why because the the uh, the commentary that is happening in the background they emphasize on important uh, things that happened in the in the country in the past and these are indicators these things that happened in the past are indicators of what is important for our country what can be asked in the exam i had a friend she cleared in the year 2014 and one thing that she would always do is from pib she would pick up the speeches of prime minister president and vice president and she would memorize them just the speeches and through that she could uh, uh, you know write beautiful answers because those keywords were embedded in her mind so these are the ways in which you can uh, pick up something that other people you know usually would lag they would they would get into revision of a complete book you would also do that but you would also start to know that these events light and sound show events what they emphasized on they were important so very very beautifully done now a quick understanding of beating retreat as i have explained earlier beating retreat is a retreat you know there's a march past to retreat towards the setting sun from the war zone right so when there is a battle happening war is like prolonged right so 30 day war and battle is like sun rise to sunset sunrise to sundown whenever there is a sundown there is a bugle which is you know that is uh, played and after that both the armies they retreat back to their camps every day when there is a battle when there is a war happening and at the end of every day battle it would happen so when india displayed its might in the republic day parade uh, this is this beating retreat ceremony always held on 29th of uh, january the the armies or the defense forces they would return back to their camps and they would again meet the next year this is what is beating retreat parade about it initiated post independence when uh, queen elizabeth came to india and prince philip also they came to india nehru got this initiated all right then we have artificial snow what is it about now artificial snow has become very very prominent and important in china and earlier in russia because we have to use this kind of snow to be able to ensure that the uh, winter olympics they go smooth and not only countries like uh, these two countries we also have artificial snow let me show this to you okay this is not working artificial snow has not only existed in these countries but also in uh, uh, in a place like dubai place which is in middle of hot scorching heat sun but yet we have created artificial snow for people for entertainment but the creation of artificial snow takes humongous amounts of energy it takes a lot of amount of groundwater because there are many places where there is water less availability of water what about uae right petroleum is cheaper than water is so uh, you know ground water and the third one is chemicals chemical because through only these kind of chemicals we ensure that there's a very rigid surface on which people are able to ski and this is something that aids again climate change right aids human health why climate change because we are using energy because we are using ground water resources creating more imbalance and uh, about uses of chemicals human health is the one which is getting impacted so artificial snow although necessary and this artificial also snow retains for a longer period of time but then it is not as good to health that is why it was in uh, news right so uh, when we had uh, uh, olympics uh, winter olympics in pyongyang just 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 four years back again there it was used so they usually happen in colder countries but then still they have to use this kind of no all right what's next so the what how do you use this that that's my point how do you use this you use this as an as a case of uh, necessary consumption of energy because of uh, the progress of the world you use this as an example of uh, what is still aiding climate change during the times of reforms right and is this actually good or against uh, uh, the progress of society or not right you can use this when you talk of generating economy out of 
diversity of uh, activities so uh, you can look at economic activity you can look at human prosperity right through these kind of activities on the other hand you can look at ecology disaster you can look at climate change so multiple ways you can use this whenever you have points to present this is the one this is one Neoko, kon kon dar gaya tha? Who all were scared about it? So there was another rumor all around that this virus is going to kill one out of three people it infects and this is going to you know, infect a lot of people. Right now this virus exists only in uh, uh, you know, animals and it has not gotten transmitted to humans. Right? So there is nothing to fear about this. This has already existed in the past also, a part of uh, MERS uh, COVID virus. And uh, this has not come to humans. So the transmission to humans, what is the keyword? What is the word when a virus gets transmitted from animals to humans? Anybody here? I need that keyword. Put that on the comments. Jeevan Raksha Padak. Now this is uh, a, 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 a Padak. This is a medal which is given to people for their bravery, for, being, for having saved somebody else's life, for meritorious act of human nature, right? What are they? Saving somebody's life, rescuing operation, natural calamities, electrocution, fire incident, all those accidents. If you have saved somebody, you would be given this kind of medal, right? So these awards were also presented as a part of uh, Ashok Chakra. See, so Ashok Chakra is presented the highest gallantry award during peace times. Ashok Chakra is presented when there is no war between the countries. And when there is no war, there are other ways of uh, you know, commemorating or uh, celebrating this kind of act of valor. Jeevan Raksha Padak is one of them, right? Again, not, not created right now, created long time back. Now there we have uh, three quick editorials. Third one first, uh, it, it talks about judicial infrastructure in our country and what is the need for it. See, uh, we have had a scheme uh, since 1993. The scheme's name has been Development of Infrastructure Facilities for District and Subordinate Judiciary. Right Now this scheme earlier was not funded very much, but later on more funds were given to this scheme. Right, So that the... Uh, infrastructure is created in lower judiciary, in, in district courts and in lower courts. So for um, courthouses, right, for example, there, there needs to be, uh, there are around 24,000 uh, lower judges who are sanctioned, but courthouses are less than 20,000. Now how do we handle this? We will need to have more courthouses. This is the fund we have to utilize. What about the residential premises for uh, the judges and judicial officers? They have to be funded through this scheme. What about uh, the ladies' toilet and a separate chamber for judges to, dis to discuss the issues, matter of importance? They are not there in many lower courts and uh, district courts. This is the reason that we need this kind of fund. This was instituted in the year 1993 specifically because India during that time went through liberalization. Liberalization means more cases, more pending issues. Therefore, we need this kind of fund. But uh, this is a central, uh, this is not a central government initiative. This is a, a centrally sponsored scheme, centrally sponsored scheme. Now, in this, is, if it was a central sector scheme, then center would have financed it. But since it is a centrally sponsored scheme, we also have state participation. Now, many times when center gives funds, they're not utilized, unutilized. Not only, it's, it's true, it's actually true here. And not only that, it is unutilized. Many times when the proportion is 60 to 40, the state has to pass 40 proportion of the funds, the state doesn't do it, right? State doesn't pass on the funds. Even if it does, the funds are utilized, diverted for some other purposes. They're not used for creation of infrastructure. And even if they use this fund, they will not account for it. So there has to be a proper accounting of the funds, you know, so that audit is done. How much rupee was, uh, how many, uh, you know, uh, lakhs rupees or thousand rupees were used to create a courtroom or ladies toilet at a premise. So this is how accounting must be done. But we don't have records of the spending also. This is leading to a lot of chaos. Now central government has given 9000 crore rupees, which is inclusive of what state government also gives. So 9000 crore rupees is a very, very good amount. This is what the editorial says, ORF editorial. But it says that we also need to ensure that accounting of this fund is done so that uh, a report is created on this, right? So do, and, and the, uh, the Chief Justice of India, Mr. Ramana also said that this kind of funding is good, but it must be under judicial scrutiny. Do not place it under Ministry of uh, Law or uh, Law and Justice. Because if you place them here, then there will be more uh, red tapeism. For example, when funds are utilized, they are also caught up between Ministry of Law and Justice, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of uh, uh, local bodies, for example, 
um, the municipal corporation of that particular area, all of them, you know, uh, because of this, the fund is not effectively utilized within time. So, this is required. The uh, second editorial talks of meritocracy uh, in civil services. See, whenever we talk of civil services reforms, you should remember a few things, right? So, one of the words for uh, uh, civil services reforms is um, the important scheme that we are running for the government, right? Reforms. So, uh, that is called Mission Karm Yogi. Yes. Karm Yogi. Now, what is Mission Karm Yogi? So, when you look up the website, you would find that Mission Karm Yogi is about uh, mid-career training, right? Appraisal. Appraisal means, you know, checking their merits and conducting exams so that they can, uh, they get, uh, you know, audited and, and they are re-energized to work again. If they are not, voluntary retirement will also be served to them. Mission Karm Yogi is not only about training, but it is also about uh, uh, reskilling and upskilling the government servants. So, people who joined these services, 30 years back, 25 years back, still serving, they didn't have mobile phones then. So, they need to be trained on this usage. Many policemen, they are still not educated, illiterate, 12th pass, 10th pass and not, and that too, during those times, Bhagwan Jane, you know, God only knows what, how they serve. And the notings have to be done in the police station, right? FIR has to be lodged. This, these people don't know this, right? So, they are inefficient. Mission Karm Yogi is for all the peoples people, right? Another thing that you should also uh, look at when you talk of uh, uh, civil services reforms, is uh, uh, lateral entry lateral entry this these things the editorial itself speaks of that these are important uh, uh, components through which one can ensure merit is the one which is way to uh, performance in civil services right so this is what this uh, editorial is about good governance professionalism these are the keywords for it India's core inflation puzzle. See, we have discussed the core inflation of our country and we have discussed both of this here, right, in one of the feature news where we talk of what is the reason for the uh, uh, the rise of uh, the, the, layer, uh, the less rise in consumer price index and the high rise in the core inflation at times, right. So, it is primarily because the, the basket which we are looking at when we look at the consumer price index or the under other indexes, it is completely different. In consumer price, we look at some of the uh, valuables, for example, food, we look at service sector, whereas when we look for uh, uh, the index, other index, core inflation index, we do not have service sector, we do not have participation of other entities. So, this is the reason that we are uh, not able to understand what is the reason for inflation of one entities, what is the reason for inflation of other entities. Largely, we are seeing food inflation happening these days because of supply chain constraints, because of um, people being, you know, using food or entities for uh, for hoarding purposes, right? So, these are the issues. This is where we speak of the dichotomy of the uh, inflation here, right? So, this is what it is about. Largely, things are clear why the inflation is different in both the segments. But, but are we going to overhaul the whole process? Right? That is the question. Right? If you like this initiative, uh, do share some love through likes, comments and shares. We put a lot of effort and through your cooperation, coordination, if your uh, blessings are there, we will be able to serve even better in all these ways. Right? So, case study of the day is, for a, is on a person who who cleared their IIT exam, but then they started to do something. So, a lot of potential with this man, but then he started to serve Indian society itself, right? So, when he saw that uh, uh, he could utilize his energy through uh, training people. So, he would help train people in many ways. For example, he started an initiative called as Kaam or Kamai, Kaam or Kamai. So, he ensured that people indulge in social work through them, social work and also earning money. Right? This is one. Many, many of my friends who didn't clear the examination, they didn't join a corporate, they joined a social sector uh, initiative, an NGO. They also pay reasonably well. So, if I say this, go and revise FCRA, Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. How are they getting paid so well? Right? How are they getting paid so well? It is because the, uh, the NGOs are spending in their salary. 50%, more than 50% expenses cannot be spent in administrative expenses. This is what the government later pointed out, right? So, okay, coming back to the topic that he started social sector initiatives. He also ensured that people uh, who are, you know, in, in urban areas, they 
they are helped during the times of pollution, disaster, self-sustenance, right? Hazard center. He set up so many things. A person with technicality utilized it for the welfare of people, direct welfare and benefit of people, right? Who are we speaking of? We are speaking of uh, Duno. His name is uh, Anubruto, Anubruto or Duno Roy, right? So IITN working for people. Quote of the day, the only way you multiply resources is with technology to really affect poor energy, poverty, energy, health, education or anything else, there is no other way. So this is where they seek technology. Not that these quotes can be quoted everywhere, but sometimes it lifts up some part of the brain, right? What a person could do, we also could do that, right? So through this, we come to the conclusion of the conversation on the uh, current affairs and gadget. We will quickly move to the featured news on the other link. So please join this. Let me look at some questions or please, things that you have put. Zoonosis. Absolutely. Thank you very much. The concept of one health. One health. Hi, Pooja. Good evening. Explore knowledge. Good evening to you. Uh, Ravi, Ravi, was this live? The, the, uh, the beating the tree. Thank you, Ravi. Great, great. Unimaginable. Absolutely. Uh, so he must say, sir, can you share some insights on artificial womb, its psychological and moral ethical implications and what should be bottom line for scientists? Where should we draw a line between synthetic and natural? Uh, hmm, nice. So, uh, this is under conflicts. Right now, uh, uh, a Chinese scientist went on to create, uh, you know, uh, babies through this and then they were uh, later imprisoned for this activity. So this is under question right now. What should be the, you know, way about creation of uh, babies through artificial means and uh, right now under ethical disputes because giving life, what arguments could be, could be, you know, uh, giving life is an act of God right or it is a natural process it must flow through natural activity and same goes for taking life also it cannot be one cannot be killed when we when we speak of uh, an issue like euthanasia the person is not strangled to death if they are not doing well right they are left the artificial uh, respiratory system everything is taken out and they pass away naturally so taking life or bringing to life these are not human acts this is one argument one can put it right now so you know so to understand that yes it is a moral activity we should not get into those domains this is one of the perspectives on the other hand we can also look at uh, technology we just looked at the technology of uh, don't know so technology can be used to empower um, pluripotent cells good for humanity absolutely all right but to what extent creation of life okay this is questioned uh, creation of uh, uh, autonomous Artificial intelligent uh, robotics. This is again under question because it will eventually threat, threat human survival only. So you should start what is good and what is not is not the point. What logic you provide is the point, right? What logic do you provide that becomes valuable. So you should also, you should always look at centering humanity, centering nature and beyond around that you should form your principles. All right, Hima, hope I have sufficiently answered this question. All right. Um, so, Ashish, I've answered your question. Refugee problem. What can we do? All right. Schedule 6. Thank you very much. Deep Shikha, good evening to you. Hi, Vinayak. Good evening. Jam predatory Amlan, good keyword to use. All right. Great. So, we will quickly meet in the other video. Thank you for participation. See you in the video for Russia and Ukraine crisis. Interesting video to discuss today. Thank you for being a participant. All right, Hima says, Sir, Ethereum founder suggested this to Elon Musk about uh, this as startup. All right. All right, understood.